Welcome everyone to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in new urbanism and allied industries, providing an opportunity for the audience to engage in real time. Uh, the webinar series is a platform for CNU members to engage, debate, and collaborate on the pressing issues of the day. Today's webinar is Jumpstarting Small Scale Urbanism. It is with Brian Falk and Kevin Klinkenberg. Uh, if you have thoughts, you can share your thoughts on On the Park Bench at tinyurl.com slash OTPB feedback. And be sure to join us for our upcoming webinars. On Tuesday, December 6th, you can join us for Zoning That Supports Physical Activity with Dr. Jamie Shriki, a professor at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And she will discuss CDC-funded research that measures zoning reform nationwide, leading to ordinances, ordinances calling for infrastructure that supports walking and biking. And on December 13th, you can join us for Authors Forum, Place and Prosperity, with author William Fulton and CNU co-founder Elizabeth Mool as they discuss place and prosperity, how cities help us connect and innovate. Uh, this is Fulton's book and it distills what he has learned as a preeminent writer on urbanism, as a planner, as a former mayor, and as an academic. And you can see all of our On the Park Benches at cnu.org slash resources slash On the Park Bench. And this is a reminder to submit your projects for the 2023 Charter Awards. These submissions are due December 16th, 2022. Uh, projects that make places accessible and equitable and embody a wide range of Charter of the New Urbanism principles are strongly encouraged to apply. We also accept student projects. And you can learn more and submit your project at cnu.org slash charter awards. And now for today's webinar. We are joined by Brian Falk. Brian is director of the nonprofit Project for Lean Urbanism and the Center for Applied Transact Studies. He lectures internationally on the topic of lean urbanism and offers technical assistance to municipalities that recognize the value of small scale economic development and want to create pink zones to enable it in their communities. And Kevin Klinkenberg, uh, for 25 years, Kevin has worked as an urban designer, planner, and architect. He's worked in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors and now leads Midtown KC now as executive director. His past experience includes 10 years as a partner and co-founder of 180 Urban Design and Architecture in Kansas City, which worked on projects in 27 states for all manner of public and private clients. While living in Savannah, Georgia, Kevin led the Development and Renewal Authority as executive director for four years. He's also worked on his own as K2 Urban Design with a goal to help public and private agencies make the transition to the next generation of planning and development. Kevin has also authored Why I Walk, Taking a Step to, in the Right Direction and the House Hacking Manual. And I'm Lauren Mayer, Communications Manager at CNU. And I will now turn it over to Kevin and Brian to start their presentations. Thank you, Lauren. It's very nice to be here with you today. We appreciate the invitation to come and talk with you. So I will share my screen. Does that look good? All good. Great. So I'll start first with um, with an introduction to lean urbanism. Uh, first of all, lean urbanism recognizes the value of small scale economic development, and it provides methods to make that economic development possible. Uh, I mean by that entrepreneurship, uh, but for the purpose of this discussion, we'll focus primarily on the small scale re uh, real estate development. This first point you see there, uh, CNU has published a couple articles recently um, on the topic. Uh, hopefully to new urbanists, we don't need to spend a lot of time talking about uh, the benefits of a finer grain for good urbanism and walkability. Uh, but 
Oh, my slide's not advancing. Just a moment. There we go. Uh, but CNU has published a couple uh, really good articles on that recently. Uh, one on the uh, opportunities of, of alleys and mews and, and so forth, uh, and the other on uh, the potential of inner block development. Sorry, my screen's not advancing. There we go. And uh, Kevin also uh, wrote an excellent blog post a while back uh, about the value of small parcels. And so I would recommend that all of you go and check out these resources. Um, regarding the, uh, the second and third points there on that list, uh, uh, Strong Towns, uh, really great uh, advocacy organization and uh, Urban 3 have both done excellent work on um, uh, analyzing and uh, presenting resources and information about those. So I would direct you to Strong Towns and Urban 3 for those as well. Uh, that following point about the value of keeping wealth local uh, we have a paper on our website that was written by Ann Daigle. Uh, it's called The Lean Business of Place-Based Enterprise. I think that's an excellent resource if people are looking for information about that. It, a, a, a couple primary points from it, though, are that almost all businesses have fewer than 20 employees. So almost all businesses are small. And that those businesses, uh, the smaller ones, the locally owned businesses, return 52 to 79% of their revenue to the local community versus only 14% from the larger nationally owned companies. Uh, that's one paper that you'll find on, the, uh, on our website. Uh, you can go and find about I think 30 other position papers and case studies if you'd like more information about uh, the value of small scale urbanism. This final point you see here about, um, about inclusivity and more participation is also really important. What we're talking about is uh, uh, the difference between small scale and large scale projects. For the large scale projects, the local community's involvement usually amounts to little more than uh, giving their feedback at public outreach meetings and either supporting or opposing projects. But with small scale projects, we're allowing more people to actually participate in building, in building their homes, their businesses, their communities. And, and so that leads to enabling community-led growth. And these are important not only for the strength of the community, but also um, issues related to equity, avoiding displacement, uh, to preserving or uh, changing neighborhood character, but based on what the community desires. So lean urbanism also recognizes the obstacles that are faced by small-scale economic development. The first two points you see here go together. We have to recognize that when a city puts the same requirements on all projects, regardless of scale, that those requirements place disproportionate burdens on the smaller projects and therefore privilege the larger projects. What that creates is a system that excludes those that have fewer resources and in fact, this closed system often requires the wrong types of resources. So for example, rather than um, knowing how to run a business, to uh, build or develop a project, to be landlords, what this system requires is that the project leaders uh, know the rules, that they have expertise in navigating the complex systems that they've instituted. So, um, if, a, if an individual or if a, a company has enough resources, they can hire this expertise. 
But if not, then they just have to figure that out. They have to figure out how to navigate that process to learn what all the rules are. And that unfortunately takes time that most businesses, uh, most small projects don't have. So lean urbanism works to make this small scale economic development possible. It does that by focusing on low cost or no cost techniques that lower barriers to entry, that create situations where all projects compete on a level playing field, regardless of scale, where the processes of, uh, of development are easier, faster, and cheaper for the small projects. At, Small town, uh, I'm sorry, Strong Towns has done uh, a really great job of uh, documenting the power of small scale economic development. And what lean urbanism does is it lets communities unleash that power. So at the Project for Lean Urbanism, uh, we raise awareness of the value of small scale economic development, of the obstacles it faces and we provide free tools to make it possible. Uh, we've also heard from people who would like to uh, have pink zones in their community so they could employ lean urbanism strategies, uh, but either aren't able to or don't want to do it themselves. So we also provide technical assistance to help with that. So on our website, you'll find our free toolkit uh, the Project for Lean Urbanism is a nonprofit program, so all the tools are free. We've created six of them so far. You see them there, but we're adding more. Uh, more will be available uh, as time goes by. So if you want to stay up to date, uh, sign up on the website and we'll do that. Also, on the, uh, in that tool section on our website, you'll find a list of free resources that other organizations have created that we've compiled for your use. So the two tools that uh, Kevin and I will be talking about today are the Pink Zone Manual and the House Hacking Catalog. <clears throat> the Pink Zone Manual is our primary tool. Uh, it offers a, a framework for implementing various uh, tools and strategies to, to make small possible. Uh, Pink Zone, if you're not familiar with it, is an area where red tape is lightened. It's an area where barriers are lowered, where it's easier, faster, cheaper to create small businesses, to develop small properties. It's an area where new ideas are explored, uh, where new uh, techniques are tested, and it's almost always of a very small size. So when you're thinking of the size of a pink zone, think of something smaller than a neighborhood scale, for example. The pink zone process has three parts to it. The first part is the lean scan. It's an assessment tool, and uh, its purpose is to identify obstacles in a local community, to small-scale economic development, also to identify assets that can be used, and to identify a location for the pink zone. The lean scan consists mostly of interviews. It's meetings, uh, discussions with uh, municipal staff, with local business owners, with small-scale developers, with lenders, with the people who work in, in that field. Um, this is an excerpt from, uh, from the, the manual, you see here that that's the way it's laid out as a manual. Each section has specific steps in it and detailed instructions. Uh, each section also has a checklist at the end to make sure that you're, uh, th that you're doing what you need to do. The second part of the pink zone uh, is the workshop to create, uh, to actually create the pink zone. So what you do is you take the info gathered in the lean scan and you bring to the table people who have the authority and the ability and the willingness to actually make the changes that are needed. And you come to agreement on new protocols to remove those obstacles. Uh, new urbanists might, um, it might help for new urbanists to, to think of this as being a little bit like a charrette, except the difference is that it's geared more toward policy than it is toward design. Uh, this section here in the manual includes guidance on 
how to choose the right format for the workshop and instructions for how to actually conduct it. The third part of the process is putting the new protocols in place. So this section includes um, instructions on how to write and implement the action plan on how to communicate with staff and entrepreneurs and small scale developers in the community um, to make sure that everyone is aware of the new protocols and is taking advantage of them. Uh, it also includes instructions on how to evaluate what works and what, what doesn't, how to make adjustments to it. Um, the, the results of this process for the community are that it gains momentum for redevelopment. And the community members are uh, now able to participate in this economic growth. And those, uh, that, that participation means not only that they're participating, but also benefiting from that economic growth. What the city gets is a replicable model. This means that uh, they learn what does and doesn't work and they can uh, create other pink zones in the community or uh, perhaps implement some of those protocols citywide. The manual also includes uh, a substantial appendix. <clears throat> uh, the appendix includes things like a checklist uh, for, for choosing the best pink zone locations. It includes interview guides with questions for uh, the different people you would be talking with. And it also has an extensive list of the common obstacles uh, that you'll encounter in a pink zone process and strategies that you could employ uh, to use it, to, to actually make the pink zone work. That appendix also includes a section uh, on meantime uses. And I think this is uh, important to bring up for the subject of jumpstarting small-scale urbanism. We encountered a lot of property owners and prospective uh, entrepreneurs who had, who had goals that were um, maybe ambitious and the markets that they were working in weren't ready for the type of investment they had in mind for their projects. And so a lot of these people assumed that their choices for their projects were binary. It was 100% of what they wanted to do, or it was 0%. And they would just decide that they could do it and do it all, or they couldn't do anything, and they would wait for the market to improve. But the important point we wanted to make to them, and especially to those who are looking to jumpstart small-scale urbanism, is that there are a lot of things that can be done in the meantime. And that's why we call them meantime uses. That you can start small on projects. You can take small steps to accomplish that goal rather than just one single big step. You can start with the step that you can achieve and you can take the next step when it's affordable, when it's justifiable, when you have the resources to make it happen. Uh, so the the examples here in this section uh, in the appendix uh, deal with both commercial and residential uh, meantime uses. I think that's a good segue uh, to move on to the house hacking, the house hacking catalog. Uh, I worked with and, and uh, known Kevin for a long time, known that he's not only uh, an accomplished um, architect and designer and uh, 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 organizational leader, but also that he had um, done house hacking himself and uh, that he is the moderator of a, a Facebook group dedicated to house hacking. And um, I believe strongly that house hacking is an excellent way for uh, community members uh, to get on that first rung of the property ownership uh, uh, ladder, uh, but also for small scale developers to take on their first projects. And um, I asked him to, to come and work with us to create this house hacking catalog. And um, I'll ask him now to step in and uh, uh, to explain exactly what it is. So uh, Kevin, 
let me um, stop sharing my screen and I'll ask you to take over, please. All right. Well, thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. Um, I can't say enough good things about the work that uh, Brian and his group have done. And uh, you really should, if you're interested in these issues, dive over to the leanurbanism.org uh, website. The tools are fantastic. Uh, in addition to this manual, we also worked on a pink zone together in Savannah, Georgia, uh, and really learned a lot through that process. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of these tools maybe aren't, um, and even when I talk about house hacking, may not be the most applicable if you're in one of the five or six really expensive urban markets in the country um, that, um, you know, that are incredibly successful, but for virtually anywhere else uh, in the country, um, these ideas and these tools can work and they can help a wide variety of places. So I, I'd really encourage everybody to take a look at the Lean Urbanism uh, website. All right, let me see if I can uh, make this happen. Um, yeah, there we go. And I need to switch. Okay, that look good, uh, Brian and everybody? Okay, well, um, yes. oops, I wanna head back up here to the beginning. So house hacking is uh, something that I, um, Interestingly enough, I guess I'd always been interested in um, before there was really this kind of cool term for it. Uh, and it's something that's really been with us uh, for a very long time. Uh, we've had this blip over the last, I would say 50 to 70 years where the idea of uh, home ownership and wealth building became a very singular idea of just kind of owning a single family house on its own lot and that was it. But historically speaking, what we're gonna talk about today was incredibly common. Uh, and uh, I think it really hits the, uh, you know, there are three bullet points that I think are incredibly important that I'll try to hit on today. One is what Brian mentioned with this idea of creating fine-grained urbanism, which is something all of us in the CNU, I think, really care, uh, care deeply about. You know, this notion of uh, missing middle uh, housing. How do we actually create it? Who are the people that are really going to create it? And my message you know, today is the people are you. It's, it's you and me and us and all of us uh, who will do this. It's not the big developer who's gonna create the missing middle um, projects that we, that we love so much and we'd like to see more of. And also the, the notion of building local wealth. This is incredibly important as part of this topic. And I think you'll see uh, through some of the examples that I give and, and how that ties to um, really the incredible personal financial benefits of uh, pursuing house hacking, especially if you're able to do it a couple of times uh, over the course of your life. Um, so this one's a little bit, a uh, uh, couple of years old uh, um, now, but looking at just the, the rise in search terms for house hacking, it's obviously become a very popular thing in the last few years. Um, seen a lot of articles about it, uh, real estate, uh, uh, trade magazines and articles have really picked up on it and, and why this is becoming a big deal. Uh, this uh, was the, uh, the original version. We've got a new cover now that Brian has worked on for the House Hacking Catalog. You can download that full catalog for free on the Lean Urbanism website. That's the, another really cool thing about the tools there is they're all free and downloadable. So please take advantage of that. There was also another book that came out um, a couple of years ago by a, an author named Craig Kurloff called The House Hacking Strategy. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about what he pursues in this. It's, a, it's an interesting case study. He talks uh, a little bit more about the idea of a roommate house as something that he used in a more expensive market uh, a couple of times. It's a really cool idea as well. And um, uh, there, again, there's a lot of different ways to, to approach strategies for house hacking. And then Brian mentioned this, but I do moderate a Facebook group called Choose FI House Hacking. Um, and there's, um, there's over 5,000 members on it now. Uh, and people all over the country, all over the world, sharing their own tips and questions uh, about anybody interested in pursuing this approach. So really some good, um, good dialogue on that group. So what I wanted to do um, is kind of roll through some case studies because I, I think sometimes this is, it's easier to understand the idea of house hacking by working through some concrete examples. 
the house hacking catalog that we wrote does detail a, the wide variety of types of buildings that are most likely um, to be seen for a house hacking approach. Uh, and then it also has a number of uh, personal case studies, um, three of which I'm going to share that I have done over the years and um, I think can be helpful as you begin to think about how, how you might approach this. And the general notion, again, here is trying to use uh, your investment in getting a mortgage uh, on a property as a way to uh, create other income for yourself. Uh, and so it's not just getting a mortgage to buy that single family detached house, but it's getting a mortgage to see, well, is there other ways uh, for me to have some income on that? My first um, experience with this was buying this property in the mid 1990s, which was actually built as a single family house originally, but had been carved up uh, over the years into three separate units. So it was a triplex and I bought, uh, I bought this <clears throat> um, at a time period when the neighborhood was still um, not all that great. The build, I call this my not great triplex because it was uh, not in, in you know, terribly great condition. Uh, but it had three separate units, uh, and uh, I lived in one and rented out the other two, and uh, eventually uh, fixed up the, the property bit by bit over the course of about a decade, uh, made a lot of improvements. So I've, I've got some numbers on the screen that I'm going to share throughout this. It's been a couple of years since I've given this presentation, so they're a little old, but I think you can get the general gist of this. So um, the... Um, the, the uh, inflation adjusted value in 2019 for what I actually bought it at was 140,000. Uh, and um, that value of course is about double today uh, uh, what it actually prices out for. So in real terms, what that means is that um, if it was $275,000 as a purchase price that you would, you know, if you were putting 10% down which you wouldn't have to, you could buy a property like this for uh, even 3% down with an FHA loan or 5% down with a lot of conventional mortgages. But if you put 10% down, you know, you're looking at about $27,000 in cash and a mortgage of about 1500 a month or 1600 a month. Now in my market, the rents that you would get, even if you lived on one of the floors and rented out the other two, would exceed that $1,600 a month. And that was kind of my experience in owning this triplex, that I was able to cover the mortgage um, with the rents that I received. Uh, so there's obvious benefits to that. I was a young person at the time. One thing that it really allowed me to do was it allowed me to go into business for myself at a young age. Uh, and be an entrepreneur and do so without really having to worry about my housing cost. Um, so, and if you've been an entrepreneur, you know that sometimes it's a struggle. The first year I did it was a real struggle uh, economically. And then it took off pretty well after that. But having this property and effectively having you know, no um, housing expense was really a great uh, catalyst for me. Uh, the second time that I did it, um, I, while I still had that house, I decided to build a new house with a carriage house uh, in back. This was the house that I built in about 2005. I call it Misadventures in New Construction because it was it all ended up being way more expensive than I anticipated at the time. Uh, so I spent more on the project than uh, I really would have liked to. But I did have a at the end of it, I had a house that was about three hundred fifty thousand dollar value. Uh, and I, it had a, uh, it was a three bedroom uh, house at the front, but it had this really large one bedroom carriage house in the back with over a three car garage. So again, this is what we would call an ADU today, an accessory dwelling unit, uh, becoming very popular all, all over the country. And in this case, again, if you were to buy this and say put 10% down, that's a $35,000 down payment. Again, you could buy this for a 3% or a 5% uh, mortgage. Uh, that cost was about $2,000 a month. In my market, you could easily rent that apartment for $1,000 a month. So you're living in effectively a really nice place for well under the, the normal cost uh, of the market. Um, third time I did this was uh, living in Savannah, Georgia. Um, we, my wife and I bought this uh, townhouse that you see on the left-hand side, number 308. This is a five-unit townhouse building that were all uh, individual fee simple townhouses. Um, it had a walkway to the back that led to this carriage house in the back that was a one bedroom apartment over a two car garage. And in this particular case study, um, we actually purchased this house. It was not listed for sale. We pursued it off market and were able to buy it. 
Uh, you can see what we paid, what the mortgage was. And in that market in Savannah, we were able to rent it. Uh, we did monthly rentals instead of annual rentals and it basically paid the mortgage. Uh, so again, uh, you can imagine um, the, the financial benefits that that leads to when you're able to cover your mortgage with some other rental unit on the property. And in this case, we hardly ever really knew. It's one of the benefits of an ADU or a carriage house is we hardly ever knew that the, the tenants were there in the back. Um, and so there was tremendous benefit to that. Um, <clears throat> I'm showing you some, some numbers just from the Kansas City market. This is obviously different market by market. Um, and some numbers of what our medium new homes cost and medium new existing homes. The point of all this is to show you that if you instead of purchasing a new a typical home, we're looking at a duplex or a triplex, um, you can get an idea of what your uh, monthly payment would look like after the income and what your actual income is needed to qualify. And they're significantly different than if you were buying a single family detached home. Uh, if you can show the lender uh, the income possibilities off of the duplex or triplex, you actually need less income yourself uh, to buy the unit. So that's a big deal from a personal financial side. And if you happen to be a new urbanist and you're looking to live in a place where you don't have to drive very much, uh, and you can, if you're two adults and you can live on one less car per household, you can begin to see that the, the expenses that you save over the course of just a decade, how quickly those add up. Uh, so uh, the reduced housing expense, the reduced car expense, um, you know, if you look at a, at a compound interest, that's over a quarter million dollar savings in just a decade. You start to multiply that a couple of times in your life and you get the idea. So house hacking can come in a, in a wide variety of forms. This, this is a typical duplex. Here's a mixed use building um, where you can imagine three or four units over a store. You could, you could get a mortgage and live in that. There are four plexes, houses with carriage houses. And, uh, and so on. So one of the caveats obviously is that in many markets, this type of housing is effectively illegal uh, with our current zoning efforts. And that's why we work very hard as new urbanists to try to change zoning where we can. That triplex, it would not be allowed to be built brand new in that zoning district today. Uh, the same uh, was true of the house I did with the carriage house. Now we have fortunately just fixed that in my city where we've been able to legalize ADUs uh, citywide, but in many, many jurisdictions, that is still not allowed. Uh, when we did the, the Savannah one, that was legal. So that was a, that was a, a nice deal. This is our current house. And, you know, uh, and, and again, we may look to replace that uh, little garage you see in the back with, a, with an ADU at some point. And that's kind of the hope here is now that we've legalized ADUs um, to be able to take uh, advantage of that opportunity. So uh, I would just sum up by saying, you know, if you're looking to do this, if you're interested in house hacking, it's much easier to start with an existing building that needs, you know, a little bit of TLC uh, and put in that sweat, sweat equity yourself. Uh, you can get a conventional mortgage of up to four units in one property. So a fourplex, and if you live in one unit, you can get a conventional mortgage for that. Uh, it may be cha more challenging. You may have to talk to multiple lenders, but you can do that. Those programs are out there. Uh, and uh, I think it's great to do this and rinse and repeat. Uh, buy one, live in it for a while. Uh, and then if you're in the same city, you could do it again. Um, and it really is a great, uh, it, it's almost like a great gateway drug to becoming a developer if you're all interested in that. If you're not interested in that, it still has incredible benefits for you and for your community uh, in terms of providing this kind of housing um, and this choice for people. So um, that is a quick summary and overview of house hacking. I will come back and stop the screen share and I'm happy to answer any questions that, uh, that you all have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kevin and Brian. Those were some great presentations. Um, I had a few questions kind of coming out of that presentation that I'd love to get your answers on. Um, one of those is, can you just give some examples of the most common types of red tape or what makes illegal uh, that a house hacker or somebody in lean coding uh, might encounter? Um, and then if you just have any specific examples of 
how to work within that red tape or how to change it. Sure. Well, a, a couple um, come to mind very quickly. I think Kevin can probably list even, even more. But the first is the one that he mentioned. Um, in most cities in the U.S., 70% plus, I think, is the average of, uh, of municipal land that is owned for single family only residential. And those just simply don't allow um, the building of an ADU or the conversion of a garage or the uh, conversion of a basement or an attic um, into a duplex or larger. So single family uh, residential zoning, I think, is the, the one that applies the most. There are others um, when ADUs are allowed, um, they often have um, owner-occupant uh, requirements. Uh, that's often very difficult. Kevin is talking about hacking, uh, but and in most cases, the hacker does live there, but he's also talking about rinsing and repeating. And so if you uh, move on to that second project, you don't want to sell your uh, first one. You want to be able to rent both the accessory as well as the, the main dwelling unit. And where uh, owner-occupant laws are, are, are there, you can't do that. There are other things related to um, a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of utilities have uh, requirements for um, second electrical meters um, that are very expensive to uh, uh, to install. Uh, things related to water, where um, second taps are required, you actually have to to uh, dig out to the street to tap into the main things that are just very expensive. Um, uh, there are things like parking requirements where each unit is required to have more parking that is feasible uh, for the property. Um, I had a couple other in mind that have escaped me. Kevin, I'm sure you, you, you can list quite a few very quickly. Well, I mean, that's a great list, Brian, and it's going to vary a little bit city by city. You know, we've worked a lot of years in, in the CNU to promote form-based codes as a solution for a lot of this, and they really can be. But if, if you're in a city where that's just not really uh, likely to happen, um, you know, in my city, in Kansas City, Missouri, um, it's just that's a slow, unlikely path to happen uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, we may get there eventually, but uh, I think if you can find opportunities to just bite off some of these smaller um, specific items uh, to, to change, then you could have, uh, that, that's really, I think, a better way to go in, in complicated jurisdictions. Um, so we were able to get accessory dwelling units uh, codified here in Kansas City, Missouri, by just focusing on that issue and nothing else. Uh, it, is that a perfect solution? No, it's not. And, there, and it does have an owner occupancy requirement. Um, but it's still a huge positive change that will impact the lives of a lot of people and open up that opportunity for a lot of people. So sometimes you have to not let the perfect be the enemy of the good and look for ways to minimize the worst uh, elements uh, in your codes or other things that could be a problem. Wonderful, thanks so much. That uh, dovetails nicely with another question I had, which was, what are the main characteristics of a successful house hack or small scale urbanism project? <laughs> well, it, it, it had better make money. <laughs> it had better pencil out. Uh, if it doesn't, you know, that where people can get in over their head pretty quickly is if they, you know, maybe aren't looking closely enough at the financials uh, and uh, get, get in and over their head with a property that's too expensive and maybe doesn't rent for as much, you know, on the other side as they hope for. Um, so I, I really do like to advise people, if you have the opportunity, if you live in a place where you can start with an existing building, if you're young and you can go to a neighborhood that's, you know, like an up and coming neighborhood, but not really the hot neighborhood now, uh, do that, you know, find a place where it's a little less expensive and allow you to learn, you know, because you're going to have to learn how to be a landlord, uh, among other things. Uh, and um, 
and none of that's hard. None of this is rocket science. And anybody, you know, who has the uh, um, sort of stick to itiveness can do it. Um, but um, you know, there are some things you're going to learn along the way, especially about financing and dealing with tenants and and everything else. And it can be incredibly rewarding, not just a financially rewarding, but I, you know, I've made great friends over the years and had great experiences with people that I've rented to. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of reward in it, but you're going to have to learn. So just don't try to take on too much too quickly. Great. Um, so kind of also on the topic of landlording and things of that nature, um, house hacking is a way to create income with a house, with a house to offset costs. At the same time, there has also been a lot of discussion around the negative impacts of short-term rentals uh, through things like Airbnb. Um, and what is kind of the difference between house hacking and Airbnb and that style of short-term renting? Well, I can take that real quick. And then, you know, Brian, feel free to jump in. I mean, we talked about this a little bit in the catalog, but there are different, uh, different ways to rent. Um, and... Um, you know, I have rented to long-term tenants, I've rented to monthly tenants, and I've done a little bit of Airbnb um, with our ADUs. Uh, and you just have to figure out what works for you and your own personal goals in that regard. You know, much of the pushback in regard to short-term rentals has to do with larger corporate entities that come into a community and buy 30, 40, 50 properties, uh, and essentially are running almost like unlicensed hotels. Uh, and, um, you know, th there's a gulf of a difference between somebody doing that versus somebody who owns a property, lives on it, uh, and is renting a room out or renting out uh, a carriage house or a separate unit or whatever to really benefit themselves. So uh, almost everybody we talk to has really no objection to that type of short-term rental. They get really more nervous about, like, the, the larger entities buying up multiple homes in a neighborhood and converting them. Um, so I don't know, Brian, if you have any thoughts on all that. A couple. Um, I, I think the, the answer to your question, Lauren, is that there isn't necessarily any difference. House hacking can be any of those formats, any way of, of renting. But I, I think when you're, when you're talking about the resistance to short-term rentals and, and how that's relevant to house hacking, I think what Kevin said um, is important that the 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 two primary um, objections I think are that uh, you're taking valuable housing um, off the market for in in a community where housing is needed um, there may be a crisis uh, this is an, a, a place where if you're using it for short term rentals where the community members can't use it uh, and the other is uh, the change to a neighborhood, the effect it has on the character of a place. And I think in both of these cases, uh, you're, when you're adding housing, you're not taking it away. You're not removing uh, a, a unit that existed before that a community member lived in. You're actually not uh, 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 reducing the number of housing units in a community. But then also, if all you have is a roommate or um, an ADU in the back or a little um, apartment in your building, you're not changing the character of the community. That totally makes sense. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then turn it over to the audience Q&A. So feel free to get your questions in now. Um, kind of my last question to wrap things up is about lean urbanism and how can issues of equity uh, be addressed through the process of lean urbanism? Well, equity is at the heart of it. Um, one of the problems we identified when we began the project was the, the difficulty for community members to participate in community building. That it was, it, it was because of the system that we have created, we have a situation where almost all we see is big projects by big deep pocketed actors. And the smaller projects 
um, are too difficult. And so making small projects easier enables more people in the community to participate in it, whether it's house hacking or building their home, starting a business, um, <clears throat> owning the, the, the property where, where they uh, have their business, um, just getting involved in the community and benefiting from that redevelopment and that growth. So it's a matter of uh, inclusion. Um, it's, it's allowing more people to access this process. Uh, it's a matter of uh, character of communities. It's a matter of, uh, uh, well, when I'm talking about character, what I mean is that when people are actually taking part in the change of their community, they get to affect it and they get to decide whether they want it to change or whether they want to preserve it. Um, and then also you have the, the economic uh, benefit from it, the wealth building in the community. I think it, it's at the heart of lean urbanism. Yeah, and I, I would add, you know, Brian, um, to my recollection, I think nearly all the pink zones that you worked on were basically in lower wealth communities. And it, that was really baked into the whole notion of how can, how can we use some of the tools that we've learned over the years as new urbanists to really help uh, people get on that first and second rung of the ladder to build wealth for themselves. Uh, and uh, I think that's, it's critical. I mean, it's just been uh, like the slide you had with the uh, meantime uses, you know, just through too many good intentions over like a hundred years, we've just made it incredibly hard for people to get started doing anything. And this is this is an effort to try to show how we can correct some of that and, and help people out. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to some audience Q and A's, and I'm actually going to combine two that just came in, which is the first part by someone is in reaction to Kevin's uh, purchases of homes. Uh, will the same be possible in, today, in today's time with the recession? Is buying a house possible? And combined with the mention that this house buying is difficult to do in popular expensive cities, and what steps or resources do you recommend to a homeowner or small scale developer uh, that to talk about uh, properties and getting them purchased in some of these areas? Uh, well, move, move out of those expensive cities. You don't really want to be there anyway. We, and plus, you know, we'd love to have you in some of our less expensive. There's a lot of very inexpensive markets that would love to have you and your energy. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're heading into a housing downturn. Uh, I, I think we're going to see housing get a lot cheaper. Um, it's already happening. Prices are starting to come down. We're going to, we're probably going to see some uh, uh, cheaper housing. But I, I just would also... You know, I'm old enough now that the, to, re, to have seen sort of the ups and downs of the mortgage market and the housing market uh, over a lot of years. Uh, and I know everybody's starting to freak out about mortgage rates right now. But I think the first, I think that first house I bought, I think that, I think I had an 8% mortgage on it. You know, historically speaking, six, seven, eight percent mortgages are very normal. Now it's going to take some time for us to adjust to that new reality uh, because we've had unprecedented historically low mortgage rates for a decade. Um, but I think, uh, you know, given a year or two, the market will probably reset and, and be okay. So I would, you know, look for opportunities. There's, there are always deals in a market. And in a down market, if you have saved some money up and have an opportunity to buy, you're going to find opportunities uh, in a down market. Um, and um, there are tremendous, you know, financing tools to help people get started. If it's a first time uh, purchase, you know, there's some great three and 5% programs uh, uh, or very low money down to really help. And th those can work for any of the sort of things that we've described today. Kevin talked about the additional income that comes with house hacking, and that's that it's the most obvious benefit is is making your uh, house purchase and your mortgage more affordable, um, perhaps also being able to help you qualify it. But yes, as Kevin was just saying, um, 
r rates look really high compared to what they have been over the last few years, uh, but may not be unmanageable. And especially if you expect them to go down again um, in the near future, um, if, if having uh, a roommate or a tenant uh, helps you afford it now, um, imagine what better position you'll be in when rates do go down and you're able to refinance. Yeah. And, and don't be afraid of going, you know, uh, of going to a part of town that's not the popular part of town or taking on a property that needs some work. You're not going to be judici judicious and you don't want to, you know, take on a money trap. But uh, my God, when I bought that uh, first triplex in 94 or 95, whenever that was, I mean, I was a young architect making almost nothing uh, in terms of an income. And um you know, it's it's very possible. You, you may just have to uh, look outside of the most desirable areas or even some of the most more expensive cities. And look for places where you can live car light, as yeah. Kevin said. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a way not only of um, increasing your income, but also reducing your spent your expenses. Cars are the uh, typically the second largest expense for U.S. households. Absolutely. Thanks so much. We also have a couple questions coming in about pink zones. Um, so the first part of this question is, is the downtown district the logical place to start in a city for establishing a pink zone? And follow that up with somebody saying, Brian Hart saying, in small towns such as the one I live in, all of the lots in the core are from 25 feet to 66 feet wide, already fine grained. Why not pink zone the entire core, not just one area? Okay, so I'll answer that one first. And the the primary reason why we suggest making it small is because it's it's more palatable to the municipality, um, primarily because it's easier to manage. Uh, if you're if if you're piloting. Uh, uh, new protocols, it's often more palatable uh, to the municipal staff if you're talking about a small area, so it won't overwhelm them with changes. And also because of the uh, typical psychological resistance to change. If you're talking about small things uh, in small spaces, it's often easier. Um, the First question was, I think Lauren was, uh, are downtown districts the best locations for them? And it really yeah. just depends on the place. Uh, it might be that downtown is best. It might be that, as Kevin mentioned earlier, that that the downtowns are um, where the hot uh, markets are. It uh, depends on the place. Um, you do need to have affordable properties, really, to make uh, a pink zone small scale development uh, easy for easy enough for the people who live in and work there. Um, uh, if also if the downtown isn't uh, if the the part isn't isn't zoned for residential, um, you know you want to have that as well as commercial. You want to have a mix of uses in it. Um, so typically. Uh, I, I think if we're talking about the most common uh, uh, best sites for location, it's uh, just outside of downtown, where you'll have neighborhoods uh, that have good bones, uh, were laid out well, uh, that are close to uh, employment centers, uh, maybe that have uh, uh, either existing or previously had uh, neighborhood main streets. So you can have businesses as well as residences. Uh, you can get to places easily, um, and hopefully where prices are still are, are still affordable. Kevin, you have anything to add to that? Well, just also people who are eager for change in the neighborhood. That's another uh, element to it. So those you know emerging neighborhoods, I think, can be really good. Um, and because you might find people who are really eager to see their neighborhoods improve and change. And, you know, some of the more established neighborhoods that, um, you know, already have a lot of great elements there, <laughs> you know, there's probably going to be more resistant to an approach like mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Um, and this question is from Ryan Stevenson, and they are asking, are Kevin and Brian seeing group dwelling requirements as a barrier? So uh, I think if I get what Ryan is saying, he's asking about like how some cities limit the number of people like un, un, um, unrelated right. people uh, within a house that can live together. Sometimes it's three or four or five people. Uh, and yeah, sure, that can be a barrier. Um, just depends on on your city. A lot of cities, especially a lot of college towns have that as a way to try to, they were trying to limit the spread of student housing. Um, uh, again, I think that book that Craig Curlock wrote was really uh, interesting in that regard because his strategy was to, he lived in Denver, uh, expensive market. Uh, he would look to buy a single family house that maybe had four bedrooms, live in a bedroom, and then rent out the other three to uh, other people and then use that as a strategy instead of just, um, you know, having a, a separate unit. Um, and he details, you know, really uh, how to do that approach and do it successfully. Um, but you could certainly run up against that as an issue in, in some cities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an, an example of a strategy that Kevin brought up earlier, which is um, to bite off what you can change, to um, not try to change the entire zoning code <clears throat> of, of a city. Um, that gives me an opportunity to very quickly bring up another of our tools, which is the lean code tool. And it was created for exactly that purpose. So the Center for Applied Transect Studies um, is the home of the smart code, the model transect based zoning code. And so obviously we advocate for overhauls of zoning codes, but we also recognize that most cities either won't be willing or won't be able because of the difficulty, the, the time, the expense of overhauling, won't, won't want or be able to overhaul their code. And so that tool is designed to help with exactly what Kevin was uh, describing, which is identifying the, uh, uh, the obstacles in a zoning code to small scale economic development and providing strategies to make the changes to just the to, to make strategic repairs to a, a zoning code and uh, uh, the maximum number of unrelated uh, inhabitants of a building might be an example of that kind of change. Got it. We have just a couple more questions here as we start to wrap up. This first one is from Carlton Johnson asking, have you come across or studied an ideal lot width for fine grain urbanism. It seems that 25 feet is the historical standard, but that seems to be an arbitrary standard that is based on being a roundish number versus being based on functionality. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really think there's an ideal um, number. I, 25 feet was common historically here too. It's just kind of a sub, eventual subdivision of the mile grid down. Um, and, you know, I love the 25 foot lots. Uh, I think they can work really, really well in a lot of conditions, but uh, with modern building codes, they're also a challenge. Um, modern building and zoning codes, because you're often giving up at least three feet, if not five feet off the side lot lines, um, which is unfortunate. We didn't do that historically, but we do that now. Um, so I'm not, it can be a little bit more of a challenge with some of the modern codes, but you know, there are also legions of examples of you know, wonderful building types built on uh, 25 foot lots. So I, I just, yeah, I don't know that I've seen an ideal in that regard. No, I'm not, I don't know of an ideal either. I think if you can get 25 foot lots, that's wonderful. Um, it, there's also a problem where uh, sprawl suburban zoning has been overlaid on uh, uh, older areas and because of uh, not only setbacks, but minimum lot sizes, some of these uh, places can be non-conforming and, and difficult to renovate, you know, even if uh, ADUs are allowed. Um, it might make renovation or construction of an ADU uh, difficult, you know, having to get a variance to go do it or just forbidden. Um, so I, I you also have a lot of places where um, 
where properties have been aggregated. As uh, the value in markets has declined, a lot of a lot of people have bought up adjoining lots, and and uh, so you also need to make it really easy and fast and cheap to subdivide lots. Um, that's for residential or commercial. You know, I think regarding commercial, if you've got neighborhood main streets and um, you know if everything is 25 feet, that actually might be big uh, for for what it, it, it big enough to be sort of a, a barrier to entry because of cost for some uh, entrepreneurs or prospective owners. So if you can figure out ways to subdivide properties internally or make it possible to build smaller on um, empty lots, that's also going to be helpful. All right, thanks so much. We are at one o'clock. So thank you to our audience for the wonderful questions. Thank you to Brian and Kevin for the wonderful presentation. Uh, you can expect a recording of this available tomorrow for any of those who have missed it. And uh, you can learn more about uh, the work that we do at cnu.org. Thank you so much for spending time with us on this Tuesday. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks again, Brian and Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren.